Welcome to worship. It's nice to see you all. We're going to sing a hymn to open, which is a lovely hymn. It's called, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. Now some of you might not know it, but the words are all going to be up there. And if you just follow the praise band, then they'll keep you right, because I don't have a clue. instructions but I thought I heard you singing sometimes. Claude's going to lead us in a prayer of adoration and confession.
With this, we recognise we are part of the flesh. We come to you in prayer as a collective. We repent our sins and transgressions and ask for your mercy in the hope of your forgiveness. Our, our own sins burden us. We ask you, precious Lord, to be set free from the shackles of our misgivings and to treat others accordingly to the scriptures. We ask you to help forge a future in which we can change. God, align us within the growth of your grace and let us grow in the passions of your energy within the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Now let us be open and true to you, God, in our prayers of confession. God, we bring our sins and our dysfunctional elements to you. Forgive us for the hurt we have caused others, for bring shame upon ourselves and our loved ones. Some of us feel not ignominy, but are thwarted by the world around us and are distracted by its chaos. We tend to forget your plans and fail to carry your message within the splendour of God's name. Absolve us from our shortcomings and the unnecessary pain we put upon ourselves with paranoia and delusions. Here now, in the silence, receive our personal confessions. Precious God, we receive your wisdom for the end of moving forward in the greatness of your glory. Amen. Amen, and thanks for that, Claude. Claude, for those of you who don't know, is walking a path which he thinks will lead him to ministry in the Church of Scotland. And that's great news. But you need to tell him how he's getting on. Because you know something? I've never stood at the church at the door, at the door of a church after a service, and somebody said to me, Well, that was rubbish this morning. <laughs> Nobody has ever said that to me. They always say, Well, that was lovely, Willie. And I didn't believe that it's always lovely. But when we learn, we need to get feedback. So, if you don't mind, speak to Claude about the prayer and how he delivered it, and whether it helped you to think about your adoration of God and where we've messed up. Because we all need to learn. The length of time you left for me to confess my sins was just perfect. <laughs> I don't know about the others. But they'll tell you. About 18 months ago, Jalen and I were sitting in our lounge, and Jalen said, These curtains are fading. And I, like any man, husband, kind of just try to say nothing and ignore that comment. The obvious solution was to buy a pair of new curtains. But no, what we did was we employed an architect. I don't know you needed an architect for curtains. Anyway, who then did a design for rebuilding the front of our house to make it all glass along the front and to build a porch on the side and then on the glass along the front, there's walls to be knocked down inside. And then along the, in the glass in the front, there's the new, new blinds that are gone, Dave. This is the most expensive pair of curtains <laughs> that I've ever come across in my whole life. 
the old joke in a park. It's going to be brilliant because we designed something that we wanted to have as we grow older. A nice front bit to the house which faces south and looks over Broughty Ferry, the River Tay and then the Fife. And it'll be lovely. But it's a big project. And you know what? It hasn't gone smoothly. Once we got all the approvals from the council, the architects' drawings, the structural engineers' plans, the approvals from the council, appointed a builder, the builder started, and then there was a shortage of steel for five weeks. And they've got on with it since then, but now there's a shortage of the wood that we need for the trusses. And, and see how the knowledge you get to learn when you're replacing curtains. Trust us, who never knew where that was before? Um, there's a shortage of wood, so there'll be another delay. We have to think about new flooring. We have to think about blinds. We have to think about all sorts of other very expensive things. Not that I'm annoyed about that. But nothing seems to go just smoothly and just as we all want it to go. And sometimes along the path of a big project, you need to compromise a wee bit. You need to say, well, yeah, you know what? We would have loved these blinds that are going to cost 18,000 pounds, but actually our budget says we've only got a lot less than that. So you've got to compromise and you've got to change. And I was thinking about all of that and I was thinking about then the three congregations coming together. And for all of you, it has been and it will continue to be a bit like that. Because we can have all the great plans in the world. We can have all the doubts and all the rest of it that goes along with it. Let me assure you, yours won't be as expensive as my house front. But things will need to move as we walk along the road of the project and plan together. And we just need to deal with it that way. Because you know what? That's life. And we need to move on. And so, when you worry about the things to do with the three congregations together, just remember my blinds. I wished we'd just got new blinds. <laughs> but it wouldn't have done what we wanted to do and actually what we needed to do. Let's sing hymn 727. In the bulb, in a bulb, in the bulb, there is a flower. Do they all know this, Dave? Do you want to say anything about this? No, this is a new one. I think everybody needs to so we'll just play the, the, the thing through once and then we stand to sing and sing all three verses. It's a lovely song. <laughs>
Thank you for these readings, Thomas. Our hymn is 506, All I Once Held Dear. 506. Oh 
Let's pray. God, we come today not to just do the usual things we always do at a service on a Sunday. We come, we come to hear your word. We come to try to make sense of things going on in our life from the lessons of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. So we ask that you send your Holy Spirit on us and we ask that you open our hearts and minds to hear your world, word for our world, the reality of it today here in this place, in our community. Amen. I suppose the task of a Christian is to try to become more like Jesus. That's pretty simple, really. But I suppose the more like Jesus we become, the more ready we should be to be confronted by opposition. And why? Well, Jesus sets an agenda for us that's actually diametrically opposed to the ambitions of the world, in large part. And so that inevitably means there's going to be conflict, disagreement. And the Apostle Paul didn't have any illusions about the world being a friendly place for those who love Jesus and love God. See, Paul was a realist. Paul knew that we all needed to be ready to protect the precious message that we got from Jesus and that had been entrusted to us. And Paul used military metaphors to ram home his point. Remember our reading. Paul talks about truth. Put a metal buckle of truth around your waist. Don't be taken in by the lies and shabby glamour of the world. Keep truth as a, as a precious commodity in your dealings with other people. And be ruthlessly truthful when dealing with your own thoughts and moods. He talks about righteousness. And righteousness means the right kind of living. Living your life by the right values that God has given us through Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, put on a breastplate of righteousness. He talks about the gospel of peace. And Paul says that your boots are really important. The gospel of peace is custom made for our needs and helps us to stand firm in the peace of the gospel. And if we do that, our feet will never slip. And by peace, they're just not just referring to the lack of war. By peace, they're meaning shalom which is an overall sense of peace and well-being. He talks about faith and he talks about the shield of faith. Now, if you think about it, having a shield, you might think was another unnecessary heavy thing to lug around if you were having a fight with somebody. But Paul says no. Paul says the more we use the shield of faith, the shield to protect our faith, the better we'll be. He talks about salvation and he makes reference to our helmet. He says in case your precious head with all its thoughts and hopes in the helmet of salvation. 
and we can put this safety helmet on and wear it with confidence that we believe in salvation. And that will enable us to keep our head when things going on round about us seem to be getting tough. And then lastly he refers to the Spirit. And Paul calls the Spirit the best weapon of all. And he refers to it as our sword. So if we're called upon to attack evil in any form, put your trust in the word of God. And it's by that spirit that God speaks to us. And so, and so Paul tells his readers to be constantly on the alert, that we need to buckle up every morning and even when we prepare for bed, we should always keep our shield and the rest of our weapons close at hand. I can hear some of you now thinking, that's a wee bit over the top, Willie, is it not? Well, maybe Paul's hard life meant that he did have a bit of a persecution complex. Perhaps Paul imagined a spiritual mugger lurking on every street corner and hiding under every bed. I would want to live my life by always looking over my shoulder because if you live your life that way, surely that's an inevitable road to some form of continuing anxiety. But actually, when you think about it, the Apostle Paul, although he was always alert, he was actually also quite a chilled out and relaxed person. In fact, when I think about Paul, I think about a big pussycat. What do I mean by that? Well, you know how when a cat stretches out in the sunshine or on a rug in front of a fire or a heater? Just imagine that, picture it. Can you really think of anything more relaxing than a cat doing that? Yet if a danger suddenly threatens, you won't find any creature that's suddenly more alert and ready to deal with that threat. See, a cat has to be a fine tune for both relaxation and defense. And the Apostle Paul was actually a bit like that. He had plenty to say about peace, which came to him through Jesus Christ. He found a solid core of calm in whichever awkward situations he found himself. You see, Paul actually led a really hazardous life. He was constantly hounded by his critics. He was often hauled in for questioning by the local police. He was even banned from some cities. At times he was arrested and flogged. He was mugged by robbers. He was beaten up. He was stoned by mobs of people. He was shipwrecked. He was marooned on an island. He was imprisoned. And he was even hauled before hostile governors and kings. Yet he didn't get rattled. Today's reading is from the letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in the big city of Ephesus. He wrote it from a prison and he calls himself an ambassador in chains and a prisoner for Jesus. And as he wrote this letter to that little Christian flock in Ephesus, his own feet were probably in shackles. Paul's battle was real. But there's no sense of panic in his letter. You see, this apostolic pussycat really knew what he was talking about, both the peace and the dangers. And when Paul warns us about the constant spiritual dangers we face and asks us to always be watchful and armed on standby for an attack, he's not being a panic artist, no. This cool cat is as level-headed as they come. He knows the hazards of being loyal to Jesus Christ. 
He knows that as long as we draw breath in this world, if we're Christians, they'll never be saved from attack by others. And such spiritual assaults can take the forms of criticism and abuse, or constant sniping and sneering from other people of other faiths or unbelievers. Or we could maybe even be attacked by a whole mob of temptations. You see, pressures and temptations are always around us, and some rise up like traitors from within us. And so you don't have to be a spiritual genius to recognize that a battle for the mind and soul is always going on in the world we live in. It's rare in our culture for a Christian to be openly attacked by what, by what Paul calls flesh and blood, those clearly visible enemies, although it does still happen. Yet more widespread and more persistent and more dangerous are the hidden forces, the many pervasive influence operate from within our own culture. If we ignore these, then we've already surrendered. We've opted for the silent invasion and occupation of our souls by the alien forces opposed to the values of Jesus Christ. And we need to stand up. And we need to speak out when things are wrong. Jesus Christ stood for love, hope, justice and peace. And if things are going on in our world, in our country, in our communities, that aren't in line with that, then it's our duty, it's our values that we need to say, this is wrong. So with my Christian feet firm planting on the ground, I know that for me, spiritual armour is essential. We need to be secure in Jesus Christ. We need to be relaxed, but we need to be able to speak up and react when things that aren't right are happening. We need to be pussycat Christians. There's nothing paranoid about the warnings that Paul gives us. It's actually sound tactics from one frontline soldier who lived the Christian life to the full even when he was a prisoner for Jesus, an ambassador in chains. Today's lesson from our pussycat prisoner Paul concludes like this. Pray for me that I may be enabled to have the courage to open my mouth to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may preach daringly, which is the only way that I should do it. Well, I invite all of us to take this feisty Apostle Paul seriously, to be a pussycat Christian, not for Paul's sake, not for my sake, but for the sake of Jesus Christ and the values that he taught us and we truly believe in. Amen. We're going to remain seated and hear two verses of hymn 489, Come Down, O Love Divine. Please feel free to sing these under your masks if you want or just to sit in the choir and contemplate and reflect.
of our God, our prayer, our prayer of thanksgiving and our prayer for other people. And let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks and praise. You are our Redeemer. Your Son Jesus Christ was put to death on the cross by those who feared him and feared the values that he stood for. Their hearts were filled with jealousy, anger and hatred. Your promise of fullness of life for all people made flesh and came among us in the form of Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus' light that we see what we must do to bring your peace and justice to this world through the proclamation of the gospel in both word and action. Father God, Mother God, you gather us into the communion of your church. You never take back your call and your gifts. Your faithfulness enables us to remain always faithful to you. Your road leads us towards all who suffer in our society. Give them life by your love through your Holy Spirit. You've given us gifts in our hearts and in our bodies to make us creators of communion, communion with all people. We ask you to help us to find peace throughout our world, especially in Afghanistan right now where there's just seems to be so much turmoil and uncertainty and pain and hurt and argument. We pray for all of those who work for peace and reconciliation around our world. We pray that we might learn God to share more fairly the resources of our planet amongst all people. And we pray that we might find light and courage in the mystery of the communion that is the church. Loving God, we all know people who, for a variety of different reasons, are having a tough time of it right now. Through illness or loss. Through lack of job opportunities. Through family relationships that have turned sour. Help us to find ways in which we can help people to get through these difficulties. Sometimes by just befriending them or offering a cup of tea. And we bring these people to you now by name and our own personal prayers for other people. Hear our prayers for others in this period of quiet. Loving God, we bring all these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Saviour, who taught us our family prayer, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Coming to the end of our service, I hope you've enjoyed worship this morning. Isn't it great to have a band like that to play for us? They're brilliant, aren't they? They really are. Well done, guys. <laughs> Don't forget the service of music and songs. Think about hope for the future and what you might choose and let us know. If there's too many, we'll maybe need to have two services of music and songs, but it's better to have too many rather than too, too, too little. And remember to tell Claude what you thought about his prayer, what it did for you, or didn't do for you. And then not tell me outside I was rubbish, I was only joking about that. <laughs> do tell us what you think, it's important that we hear your feedback, seriously. Let's close our service this morning by singing 
we sing a love. Pussycat Christians, be calm and relaxed, but when challenged, be firm and strong. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you, now and forevermore. Nothing goes smoothly. <laughs> God bless you all. Have a lovely day.